أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لله ملك السماوات والأرض ويوم تقوم الساعة يومئذ يخسر المبطلون وترى كل أمة جاثية كل أمة تدعى إلى كتابها اليوم تجزون ما كنتم تعملون هذا كتابنا ينطق عليكم بالحق إنا كنا نستنسخ ما كنتم تعملون فأما الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فيدخلهم ربهم ربهم في رحمته ذلك هو الفوز المبين وأما الذين كفروا أفلم تكن آياتي تتلى عليكم فاستكبرتم وكنتم قوما مجرمين آمنا بالله Sadaq Allah al-Ali al-Azim. Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Often a society is not ready yet to be able to appreciate the wisdoms that come to it and rather it is blocking whatever potential of change there is before it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alam tara kayfa daraballahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan ka shajaratin tayyibah asluha thabitun wa faruha fis sama tu'ti ukulaha kullu heenin bi idni rabbiha. وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you not see? Are you not aware, cognizant of how Allah sets forth a parable of a good word? It is like a good tree, firmly rooted with its branches reaching out towards the sky. This tree, what does it do? yields its fruit in every season by the permission of its Lord. Allah sets forth such parables so that man can reflect on them. Sometimes a society, the roots are strong. Therefore, the tree is strong. And therefore, in every season, it will bear fruit. Yet in the subsequent verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the opposite type of tree. A tree that is rotten from its foundation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ خَبِيثَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ خَبِيثَةٍ اِجْتُثَّتْ مِنْ فَوْقِ الْأَرْضِ مَا لَهَا مِنْ قَرَارٍ And the example of an evil word, the word that comes out, the outcome that is evil, it is like an evil tree uprooted from the surface of the earth. And for it you will not find any stability. A community that is rotten from the very foundations of its structures, of its thought processes, then of course it cannot help but actually produce that sort of tree. But on the opposite side, the community whose tree is strong because its roots are strong, the fruit will be born, which is very sweet and delicious for the human being to taste. In Mecca, during that first 13 years 
of the prophethood of the messenger Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Prophet himself was only able to bring a handful, several hundred at maximum throughout his time towards the religion of Islam. Now, of course, the Prophet isn't just preaching for 13 years, right? He announces his prophethood at 40, which means for 40 years he has been establishing the example of goodness amongst them. For 13 years he has announced his prophethood. This is a struggle of 53 years of the Prophet Sallallahu presence amongst this community. And you can see, despite being there for half a century, the Prophet himself still had to migrate from Mecca to Medina because there was more opportunity to be able to establish the faith in a place like Medina than there was in Mecca. Our discussion yesterday was how do we understand and maximize the reading of those Meccan and Madinan verses? We stated that we have to receive the verses the same way the original recipients received those verses. We wish to put ourselves into those verses, live those verses for our own selves. And the more we understand how there is a marahil of growth, stage after stage after stage of growth in the city of Medina, we would appreciate how individuals, collective, and also the statecraft of the city of Medina was being built year after year, all the way up until the life of the Prophet However, in Mecca, there was not the opportunity to be able to establish something freely. After 53 years of the presence of a man who they themselves will call as sadiq and Al-Ameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives testimony in the Quran that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi even wanted to just speak an ayah, even wanted to place into the hearts of these people a moral principle that could then grow into some practice, this was so much hated by the Meccan peoples that they physically would attack the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and if not, then the verse suggests that they were on the verge of physically attacking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The verse says the following. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ تَعْرِفُوا فِي وُجُوهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الْمُنْكَرِ يَكَادُونَ يَسْطُونَ بِالَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when our ayat are recited clearly to those people who are disbelievers, you will see on their face a hatred, an anger arising in them. And then it says, In their face there is that wrath against even the recitation of the Qur'an. يَكَادُونَ يَسْطُونَ بِالَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and you will see it that they will almost strike at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, just for ayat being recited. This word, yastuna billadina yatluna alayhim, the root, according to some dictionaries, it means, you know when you, if you're on a horse, and you lift the front legs of the horse up, right? And you're just on the back legs of the horse. That's the action. You know when the horse is being lifted up, the Qur'an gives an image here. That's how the disbelievers were in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Aggressive, with their fists up, ready to pounce on the Prophet ﷺ. This is 53 years of his presence. 13 years of his open messengership. This tells us that if the ground still is not yet prepared to accept but there's a more fertile ground that sits in another city, then from the Islamic perspective, there is the encouragement for an individual to migrate 
either, of course, to save his faith, to save his life, or for the da'i in Allah, the one who is calling towards Allah, like you and I, the risaliyun, those who uphold the message until today. If we find a better opportunity to be able to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is recommended for you and I to be able to migrate to that particular location. This isn't something to be frowned upon. This isn't something that is suggestive of a failure. Sometimes the root of the society is not yet ready to be able to accept what it needed to be able to accept. At this point, the Quran has verses after verses in Mecca when the Prophet ﷺ was being encouraged to migrate away from the city of Mecca. We mentioned yesterday Surah Yusuf. Do you remember we mentioned chapter number 12 of the Quran? Of course, there's many, many themes in Surah Yusuf, but Surah Yusuf was revealed after when? The deaths of Abu Talib alayhi salam and Lady Khadija alayhi salam. This was to give solace to the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa right? It talked about Yusuf alayhi salam, the attack on him by his own family members, him being exiled, and then him being in a position where he takes over the statecraft and where eventually his own brothers will come and accept his prophethood. This was a reflection for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You are going through, will go through exactly the same as what Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam did, but in your own way. Many, many verses came in order to suggest to the Prophet preparation for migration to the city of Medina. Let's mention one or two and you'll get a flavor of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only encourages this migration, but even shows that when prophets of past have migrated, the outcome will be the establishment of their lineage, the establishment of their religion for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Maryam, we'll come back to Surah Maryam again later on in the discussion. Surah Maryam is one of the chapters that was revealed towards the end of the Meccan period. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the migration of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. He says the following. Qara araghibun anta an alihati ya Ibrahim. Ibrahim's uncle says, oh Ibrahim, do you really desire other than our gods Ibrahim? Is this what you want? La'in lam tantahi la'arjumannaka wahjurni maliya. He says, if you do not desist, I'm going to exile you. I'm going to stone you. Imagine Ibrahim alayhi salam is still a very young man. He's being threatened by not his father, but his father figure. His uncle is telling you, I'm going to stone you to death just for you rejecting my gods. No freedom of religion, no freedom of thought whatsoever. Look at how Ibrahim alayhi salam responds. And you'll see there is the reflection here in how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi responded in Mecca as well. Qala salamun alayka sa'astaghfiru laka rabbi. Peace be upon you, O my uncle. I will seek forgiveness on your behalf with my Lord. Innahu kana bi hafiyun wa a'tazilukum ma tad'una min dunillah. My Lord has always been very soft, very kind. And so he withdrew from his uncle and whatever his uncle bid him to worshipping besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَدْعُوا رَبِّي عَسَىٰ أَنْ لَا أَكُونَ بِدُعَاءِ رَبِّي شَقِيَّ I'm now going to pray to my Lord for my success of what comes next in my life after I have to leave you, after I have to flee. And my Lord has never rejected my dua. فَلَمَّا اَعْتَزَلَهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ And when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he left and he took himself away from what they worshipped besides Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, I confirm Ibrahim alayhi salam is going to have a lineage of success that comes after him. وَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَكُلًّا جَعَلْنَا نَبِيًّا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as a result of your migration, O Ibrahim, I am giving to you Ishaq and Ya'qub. Think about this. Ishaq alayhi salam 
is the father of the entirety of Banu Israel, correct? From him, on one side you get the lineage of Musa to Harun, right? On one side you get the lineage Zakaria, Yahya and Isa. On the other side of the lineage, you also end up having Ya'qub and Yusuf. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying here? O Ibrahim, by virtue of you sticking to the concept of Tawheed, despite all of the threats to your life, and actually migrating and performing this migration, this hijrah for my sake, I vouch safe for you that from your lineage will come these Anbiya and Mursaleen, but I will also ensure that you become a great nation of people, and even from your lineage, you will become established in leadership position. Ishaq alayhi salam, forefather of all of these Anbiya, but then also in this verse it says, وَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ Ya'qub gives birth to whom? Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam becomes such a head within the community that he's able to lead that community properly throughout all the challenges that it comes. According to the Mufassireen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you migrate like Ibrahim migrated. I will establish a huge community for you. And even from those family members, they will be established in authority. Migrate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to protect you. Another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives at the end of the Meccan period to encourage this migration. He now says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20 of the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, وَلَقَدْ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَسْرِي بِعِبَادِي فَاضْرِبْ لَهُمْ طَرِيقًا فِي الْبَحْرِ يَبَسًا لَا تَخَافُوا دَرَكًا وَلَا تَخْشَىٰ فَأَتْبَعَهُمْ فِرْعَوْنُ بِجُنُودِهِ فَغَشِيَهُمْ مِنَ الْيَمِّ مَا غَشِيَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He revealed to Musa alayhi salam, travel by night with Banu Israel and strike at the ground where the sea is, you will see it opening. And do not fear what happens next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then they were followed by Fir'aun and his army and they were drowned as the waves crashed over them. Remember yesterday we mentioned that if you were a companion and you're reading these verses, right? It gave you that strength from within. But if you're the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and you're being revealed these stories of Ibrahim and Musa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and you can see the successes that come out of it, Again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, with his wisdom, his divine insight, understands what is being told to him. My great, Allah is going to make you successful. Now, according to one narration, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi stated, had I not migrated to Medina, I would have gone to Yemen. Very interesting narration. Which tells us what? That the Prophet ﷺ had potential options as to where he was going to go. Now that's logical, isn't it? The Prophet, of course, needs to scope out where is going to be best for the potential of Islam to grow, to become established, and then, of course, to become the dominant religion in the region. Think about this from the perspective of His Eminence Sayyid al-Shuhada, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ajil. You know, according to narrations in our history, when Imam alayhi salam is in Hajj, before he has to break his Hajj, do you know he received 600 letters a day from across the Ummah begging him to rise against Yazid Mal'oon? Just think about that. 600 letters a day. That's a heavy load every day coming to Imam Alayhi Salam. And it's not like Facebook where you're trying to DM Imam, right? You have no Rasulullah, what's happening? You know, question for you. You know, you know <laughs> the questions that you get. No, no. Letters rise, you have our sword. 
every day in Hajj he was receiving this many number of letters. Now, if Imam is receiving letters from Yemen, which of course is a Shia stronghold community, Egypt, which of course still has the remnants of people like Malik al-Ashtar, he could get letters from Iraq, as we know of course Kufa, he's going to get letters from across the entirety of the Ummah, right? Logic says Imam alayhi salam needs to determine where is the best place to go next to respond to. Where does he go? Kufa. This is a strategic movement, isn't it? He knows Kufa has been a stronghold of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam by virtue of Amir al-Mu'mineen's position there. But also in terms of the geography, if you wish to be able to push back against Yazid Mal'oon in Damascus, Geographically, you also need to have somewhere that he cannot take over, but also can push back against him. If you're getting 30,000 swords, مثلاً, from Kufa, then of course immediately Damascus will fall by virtue of those 30,000. But at the same time, even Yazid realizes the same thing as well. And that's why he sends the governor, Ibn Ziyad, to Kufa. If we realize that there are tactics here, we realize that there is a real world that is in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa he has to choose Medina for a set of reasons, right? There has to be something in front of him that allows him to migrate there as opposed to going anywhere else, such as going to Yemen. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa choose Yemen? And how does this help us in understanding when we wish to be able to establish a community? How do we learn from these examples? So the Prophet's migration, it didn't happen in a vacuum. The Prophet prepared the groundwork in advance for his coming to Medina in order to ensure that when he arrived in Medina, there were already pockets of things established for him and it was the best decision for him to go to the city of Medina. So number one, Allah encourages him to migrate. Number two, from his own understanding and preparations, he prepares the groundwork for the ideal place to be able to go to. Medina was made up of a very plural society, meaning a number of different faiths and sects. The largest faith was the Jewish faith. There were also a plethora of Christian communities, and there were also minority communities as well there mainly of the Sabians and some Zoroastrian and others. The history of Medina is in, very interesting. Briefly, there was a king by the name of Tubba from Yemen, and he lived several hundred years, or maybe a few hundred years before the Prophet He was a tyrannical king across Arabia who sought to be able to destroy the Holy Kaaba. He wanted to destroy it before Abraha wanted to destroy it. A Jewish rabbi came to him and said to him, from Medina, Yathrib will come the prophet of Allah, the last prophet of Allah. Do not destroy any part of Arabia. Do not destroy Mecca. Do not destroy Yathrib. King Tubba, according to our narrations, said, it is unlikely I am going to live long enough then to be able to see this prophet come, if he's going to come hundreds of years from now. So I am sending my own tribe to go and live in Yathrib. He is sending this group on his behalf. This is my pledge to you, Ya Rasulullah. I can't be there, but I'm sending something ahead for you. This group that went actually became what was known as the Aus and Khazraj that became the Ansar of Islam. Medina was made up of those Yemeni tribes that moved primarily from King Tubba to the city of Yathrib. Also, Yathrib was inhabited and surrounded by other Jewish communities that had migrated from where? Palestine. Why? Because they had been told again that within your scriptures, there is your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa coming, go and prepare for him. Especially Surah Al-Baqarah talks about this. Remember yesterday we mentioned Surah Al-Baqarah, the overarching theme of it is what? 
responding to the history of the Jewish community, Banu Israel. We will go into these verses in two nights time, inshallah, when we get to it in our series about Surah Al-Baqarah. The Jewish community knew that the Prophet ﷺ was supposed to come to Yathrib. Many of them came to Yathrib. Many of them came to the surrounding areas around Yathrib. This is very interesting. Our commentators mention, they say, think about this. They knew their Prophet was coming. Some went to the city to await him. Some decided to go a few miles out, a few miles further out. Why? Some of those communities said that it's difficult for us to live in that community where pagans are. There are more lush lands around Medina. It is easier for us to be able to establish our business outside of Medina. When the Prophet comes, we'll migrate to the city of Medina. The commentators say, careful. Those individuals who wish to be able to prepare for the awaited savior, Imam al-Hajjah, Ajjad Allah Ta'ala Faraj al-Sharif, make sure that you are of the mentality of the first group, not the second group. Don't go all the way to Medina and go, I'll just wait outside. You know what? It's easier for me to make a buck outside. I won't go that last step for the Prophet. I won't go that last step for the Imam. So Medina was made up like this. It's history briefly, and it's tribes, it's communities, it's religions. And of course, each of those religions had plethora of sects amongst them as well. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that the challenge between Mecca and Medina was particularly that there were veils upon the hearts of people and there was a heaviness in their ears and there was a blindness in their eyes. SubhanAllah. It's not just one thing. It's one thing saying, you know, the people in Mecca, when the Prophet had to migrate and to where he was going to go to, they had a heaviness in their heart. Allah actually has to go a step further and give you the visualization to say that there's a deafness in their ears. Whatever they hear, it doesn't penetrate. And in their own eyes, they cannot see anything. They're blind to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa Verse after verse after verse mentions this. Listen to these verses. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْتَمِعُ إِلَيْكَ Amongst them is he who actually listens to you, Ya Rasulullah. He's, he's hearing. وَجَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّةِ However, over his heart, we have made veils. Cannot penetrate. أَنْ يَفْقَهُوهُ وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرًا and in their ears, there is a heaviness, a blockage that doesn't allow them to hear properly. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in their ears is a deafness. And were they to see every sign of truth, they would still not believe in it. So much so that when they come to you to contend, to argue with you, Ya Rasulullah, those who are bent on denying the truth, all they can end up saying is, we've heard these stories, these are just stories of the ancients and the pasts. This is the extent of what the Prophet ﷺ was dealing with. Now, if you, imagine you are the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You are now leaving Mecca Because this is your situation They're not listening They're fighting you Remember we said that verse Allah says they're, they're like horses With their hooves up Their fists up Allah is encouraging the Prophet to migrate You are the Prophet Which means Your vision Your wisdom Tells you That you're not just going to go To a random city you need to be able to go somewhere that's going to accept you, that's going to allow the burgeoning of the Muslim community to take place. Let me ask a question to you all. How would you do it? As in really, remember we said, these are real tactics. These are real institutions for us to be able to understand. How would you do it? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, 
needed to draw on ears that did not have that heaviness in them. He needed to draw on eyes that were not being blinded. He needed to draw on hearts that had not yet been veiled by their hatred of the Prophet He needed to reorient the vision of certain people so that when they looked at him, the first thing in their heart wasn't hatred, but a willingness to be able to listen. You know what the Prophet did? He managed to reach a set of peoples who in their heart, there already existed a love for truth. And what he did was helped to bring that out from within them. One of the sociologists and psychologists, he speaks about it in this way. He says, you know, when you go into a bookshop, he says, why do you immediately go to the section that you want to go to? You know, some of us, when we go into the bookshop, we'll gravitate towards a section, right? There might be history, politics, poetry, fiction. Of course, a person may browse the entire bookshop. It's possible as well. But often we know what we're looking for. Or at least there's something that exists, a question that exists within me that I know that I want this answered. So if I go in this direction to this section, maybe, maybe I will find the book that helps me in that answer. Maybe I will be able to find the book that I'm looking for, right? He says, if you understand this, you will understand what the Prophet ﷺ did. There were Christian communities. Jewish communities that were constantly debating truth, prophethood, their history, commentary of their divine books. They were lovers of God. They were the ones that were staying a night praying, hoping for the reward of Allah. They were the ones giving charity in the name of Allah. They were the ones, they were the ones, they were the ones doing this in the name of God. If you are not getting anywhere with the polytheists, Ya Rasulullah, and your life is now in danger, don't you imagine that there are others that you can easily bring towards you if you turn your attention to them in a strategic way? You know what the Prophet ﷺ did? The time he used most was the Hajj time. What an amazing strategy by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Hajj, everyone from across Arabia comes to city of Mecca. Whether you're pagan or not, Christian, Jew, Sabian, Zoroastrian, atheist, agnostic, everyone comes to Hajj. Do you know why? Because it wasn't about belief, was it? It was about money. Hajj was a trade opportunity for everyone if you can't get to everyone ya rasulullah everyone will come to you all you need to do is to be able to recite the ayat and you will see people they can't help but listen some will hate it and turn away but there will also be some who are dumbfounded by these verses all along, I've been in Najran. All along, I've been in Yemen. All along, I've been in Iraq. And we, amongst our Jewish, our Christian communities, we've been debating about Jesus. We've been debating about Abraham. We've been debating. We've been believing. We've been worshipping. Now we're hearing there's a man who is speaking the depths of these stories, the likes of which either are correcting our stories or giving us depths of insights to which we have never heard before. The Meccans realized that this was the threat. And when Hajj season came about, when the poets would come and there were the annual competitions for poetry, when there were the trade caravans, they would do their very best. And what would they say? You know the verse is better than me. Muhammad is a magician. Muhammad is a soothsayer. Muhammad is turning our youth away from our gods. This, every single 
article of lie they could place against the Prophet ﷺ, they would give him every nickname, they would give him every type of blasphemy against him. But for those people who are genuinely seekers of truth, calling someone a madman doesn't do it for you. The greatest poet at that time was by the name of Tufail bin Amr. Tufail, as he enters into the city of Mecca, a few days in advance of the Hajj season, he would come in order to prepare his poetry for it to be recited, the competitions, it could be hung on the door of the Kaaba. The narration says the Quraysh came to Tufail and said to Tufail, be careful. There's a magician, and when he spouts his words, you will become mesmerized by them, and then he will get you by his words. And he's already done this to many of our youth. Be careful of him. Hadith says to Fayl bin Amr gratefully accepted this advice from the Quraysh. The narration says he starts performing his tawaf. And as he's performing his tawaf, he's thinking about what he's just been told. There's a man who recites words that's so powerful, it's able to capture the minds of people and make them follow him. But I'm the greatest poet. If this man has such great words, I want to know what he has to say. Subhanallah. If the heart is genuinely open, it won't be closed by just someone saying, close it. The narration says that as he was performing tawaf, he actually caught up behind the Prophet ﷺ, also performing tawaf. He catches him up. And the Prophet is reciting ayat after ayat after ayat. The narration says, to fail states, I had never heard words like this before. The construction of these words, it was too much. The narration says, Prophet ﷺ ended his tawaf and he went back towards his house. To fail, decided to follow him. Prophet goes into his house, to fail, knocks on the door. Prophet welcomes him in. The next time Tufail leaves that house, he's become a Muslim bearing testimony. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now what's interesting is, remember I was telling us yesterday about the sequence of verses, right? The sequence of chapters in Medina. The sequence of chapters at the end of Makkah are phenomenal. You know what Allah Jalla Jalaluhu reveals? He reveals Surat Ibrahim at the Hajj time. Think about that. You've got the whole of Arabia flocking in on where? Makkah. And they're only coming for Hajj pilgrimage because they are seeking to make a buck. It's an opportunity for the trade caravans. And what they do is they sacrifice towards the idols. The idols make the money. They go and exchange all their ideas and their trades. And then they go back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah Ibrahim, the story of Abraham at that moment. You all know Makkah, but you don't know Makkah. You know what else was revealed at the end of the Meccan period? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals two chapters dedicated towards the Christians. Surat Al-Kahf and Surat Maryam. Al-Kahf speaks about what? The story of Ashabul Kahf. You all know it's the use. They were being forced to believe that Jesus alayhi salam was son of God. So they pulled out and they went towards the mountain. This was well known at that time as the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals it. Who else is mentioned in Surat Al-Kahf? It's the story of Dhurqanayn. It's the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. In the story of Maryam, Surah Maryam, who is mentioned? Zakaria, Yahya, Isa, Maryam, Musa, Harun, Ibrahim, Ishaq, Ya'qub, Idris, Dhul Kifl. All of these prophets are mentioned in Surah Maryam. All of these Christians, all of these Jews are coming into Makkah 
and they're hearing these stories and it's rattling them, it's shaking them, it's making them awaken to the reality of these. Another chapter that was revealed in the end of the Meccan time was Surah Al-Anbiya. This surah had a profound effect on these individuals. You know, there's a series of verses in Al-Anbiya where it talks briefly, a few lines, a few lines about each of the Prophet. And then at the end of it, you know what it says? Inna hadhihi ummatukum ummatan wahda. Allahu Akbar. Imagine you're a Christian, you're a Jew, you're hearing these verses over and over about all of these prophets that you believe in. And then at the end it comes, This is one nation. There's no such thing as your Christianity. There's no such thing as your Judaism. Allah hasn't revealed Christianity, Judaism and Islam. Allah has only ever revealed Islam. And I am your Lord, therefore worship me. How should I worship you? This is the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi will show you how to worship him. People were coming from across Arabia into Mecca. And then they were going out of Mecca, diffusing themselves into the rest of their lands. And they were conveying the message of the Prophet on his behalf, whether they realized it or didn't realize it. You know, when you go to any trip, you go on holiday, you go on ziyara, you come back, family hits you up. They say, how was it? And you tell them what your experience was. You know, I visited this place, I bought this, I went on Hajj, this is what happened, these are my stories. You don't think that if the entirety of Arabia and beyond is traveling into Mecca and here, week after week, these stories that shake their thinking, awaken the questions that are existing in them, the debates that they've been having, and then they go back to their own towns, they go back to their own cities, they're not then going to talk about what they've heard. Of course they did. One of the areas that heard it most was Najran. When we speak about Mubahala, we normally start at the end of the story of Mubahala, right? We say the Christians in Najran came and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered into a Mubahala and he defeated them. Correct. But what we don't realize is that in our history, the Christians of Najran started coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam two years before Hijrah. The first time the Najranis came, two years before Hijrah, the first delegation converted to Islam, went back to Najran. Don't you imagine, if you are these Christians from Najran, you've converted to Islam, you then go back to your region of Najran, the head of Christianity in Arabia, the head priests are in Najran, don't you think those head priests are going to get worried? They're seeing all of their Christian flock going towards this new prophet? This was what was happening. It was being diffused throughout Arabia. But the city that accepted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the most was the city of Medina. Yathrib. They had come year after year with the first pledge of Aqaba and then the second pledge of Aqaba. In the second pledge of Aqaba, what was the pledge? The pledge the Prophet ﷺ gave to them was, prepare for my coming. I am coming soon, in the next year, I want you to start preparing my coming. Not when I arrive, I start building statecraft, doing da'wah, start meeting the leaders of the city of Yathrib. From now, I want you to prepare for my coming. You know what the Prophet did, ﷺ? He had ambassadors come to Medina. And with those that had promised to give refuge to Medina to look after him, they were preaching Islam on behalf of the Prophet One of the great companions at that time, Musa'ab ibn Umair. Musa'ab, you know, he had a special duty when the Prophet migrated. The Prophet would sit inside his masjid 
And he would welcome delegation after delegation after delegation coming to him, right? And sometimes it was tribal leaders. Sometimes it was priests and rabbis. Sometimes it was slaves. Mus'ab ibn Umair had a special job. He used to sit next to the Prophet and when someone would come towards the Prophet to meet him for the first time, he would whisper into his ear, Ya Rasulullah, this is the head of such and such a tribe. Ya Rasulullah, this is his name, this is her name, this is where they're from, this is their lineage, this is how you need to watch out for them, this is what you need to be prepared for. You know how he knew that? Mus'ab ibn Umair was sent a year in advance from Mecca to Medina to preach, to get to know the community, the societies in advance of the Prophet's coming. All of this, all of this gives us huge insight into what the Prophet was doing in order to prepare the groundwork for Medina. But it also gives us great insight for ourselves about principles when we wish to be able to establish ourselves in any community. Tomorrow, brothers and sisters, you will take over the leadership of this whole community. Tomorrow you might leave this city, go to another city. Your job will take you somewhere else. Your marriage will take you somewhere else. Your life will take you somewhere else. All of you as Risaliyun, those who uphold and spread the message of Islam, if you are going to migrate, we need to know how to migrate. You think migration is just about getting the passport in Islam? This is what it means to be a muhajir? No. The muhajireen are those who prepare the groundwork and are able to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that community that they go to. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was encouraged to migrate in the Qur'an. This was not a failure in any way, shape or form. It wasn't ripe ground at that moment to continue his efforts. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi chose the city of Medina because it was best suited to be able to establish the faith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi allowed people to come to him and then when he spoke to them, they went back and carried the message, some knowingly, some unknowingly. And when the Prophet ﷺ had decided to migrate to the city of Medina, he had ambassadors go on his behalf in advance to start teaching, to start preaching. In Mecca, in Mecca the Prophet ﷺ had certain advocates. He knew this and understood this. In Medina, he needed to build those advocates before he came so that there was no chance of rejection of him. In Mecca, he had Abu Talib alayhi salam, the elder of the community. If any of the establishment, the elite, wanted to hurt the Prophet, Abu Talib alayhi salam was there to defend. He had Lady Khadija alayhi salam, a woman of great repute, if the women needed to know about who this Prophet was, Lady Khadija salam could speak. If there were Shabab and youth, Rasulullah had Ali ibn Abi Talib amongst the youth of Mecca. No one would reject Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then if there were the rough and tumble that needed to take care, he had Abu Dhar Ghifari in Mecca to take care of it. In Medina, the Prophet also needed an establishment before him to be able to diffuse what he needed to diffuse. And that was through the very Jews and Christians that were believers faithful in God. And when they heard the message, it shook them ready to listen to it. In the same way, when you and I want to be able to establish something in a community or in a city, we also need to think about who those allies are going to be in advance. We work with them in advance. We become closer together. And that is how we are able to establish what we wish to be able to establish. Tonight, we will weep over Lady Ummul Banin, salamullahi alayha. The reason why Abbas alayhi salam was born was to be the flag bearer in Karbala. 
if you imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih being so tactical, so much thinking in advance, it is no surprise then why Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was thinking about Al Abbas all those years in advance. I want you to take yourself to the afternoon of the 10th of Muharram and I want you to imagine what the farewell of Abbas alayhi salam must have been like. The poets tell us that every time Al Abbas alayhi salam came to ask for opportunity to fight, Hussein ibn Ali would say, not now. I can't bear to lose you, O oh Abbas. Eventually, after the bodies of the shuhada are left on the plains of Karbala, Abbas comes and says, O oh my master Hussein, now is the time for me to go. Listen to the reply. Imam says, O oh Abbas, if you go, who will command my army? Who will raise my flag? Abbas, the poet say, takes the hand of Hussein and says, Master Hussein, look out. Which army do you speak of? There is none left but you and I from amongst the men. I want you to envision one image, just one. Abbas alayhi salam is a giant of a human being. When he's upon the horse, his legs are dragging on the ground. Imagine the size of his alam, imagine the size of his flag. The gesture before Hussein that says, my flag that I uphold on your behalf. I want the whole world to see it. I want it to be so wide. I want everyone from across the plains of Karbala to see it. You can imagine when Sakina is outside the tents bidding farewell to her uncle Abbas. Abbas arrives at the banks of the river Euphrates. The alam is still in his hand. He begins to return back with the mashk full of water. Take yourself to that moment. What must Sakina must have been seeing? She must have seen the flag of her uncle Abbas coming back. You can imagine this child must have run back into the tents and said, Oh, Azghar, cry no longer. I see, I see the flag of my uncle Abbas returning. But when she must have run out of that tent again, she would not have seen the flag of her uncle Abbas. For this is the time in which his arms have been. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلبي ينقلبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to hasten the appearance of Imam al-Hajj عليه السلام to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death if we are to pass away from this world before his coming Ya Allah raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad Ya Allah, grant us the ziyara of Aba Abdullah al Hussein fi dunya wa akhira and grant us acceptance of all of our hajat bi haqqi Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.